subscribe, stay up to date. Episodes drop every other Monday. And welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, I wanted to talk about B-sides and album tracks. When it comes to music, I've always enjoyed the hidden gems, the songs that not everyone knows. I'm a huge Queen fan. They were my first big obsession. Bought every album. Knew all the songs. But I'll be honest, Bohemian Rhapsody, We Will Rock You, We Are the Champions, Another One Bites the Dust, Crazy Little Thing Called Love. If I never heard any of them again, I wouldn't necessarily be heartbroken. And that's not a criticism on Queen. Those have just been overplayed over the years. Queen has some phenomenal tracks that not everyone knows about. On their self-titled debut album, there's a song called Great King Rat. Amazing. The drum part's awesome, too. On Queen 2, Ogre Battle is a precursor to Bohemian Rhapsody. They were fine-tuning their skills on that song. A Day at the Races has a beautiful ballad called You Take My Breath Away. And on Jazz, there's a song called Jealousy that I think was released as a single in some places, but that's an incredible song that not many people know. These are the songs I look for. But I have two contradictions. The first is with the band The Police. I love all of their hit singles. I can listen to their greatest hits on a loop. And in fact, I was at work once, and I did just that the entire day. Probably listened to it three times. I don't get sick of their songs. But their B-sides and their album tracks, I really don't like. They get a little too experimental. The second contradiction is that two of my favorite songs are the biggest songs of that group. So my favorite, as I've mentioned before, is Right Now by Van Halen. Huge hit for them. My second favorite song is Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Another banger. So tell me your favorite hidden gems by popular bands using the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It. Two stars Watch At Your Own Risk. Three stars Standard Fair. Four stars worth checking out, and five stars must see. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. So let's jump into it. On this episode of the podcast, I'll be reviewing Wet Hot American Summer from 2001. It was directed by David Wayne, who helmed Wonderlust, They Came Together, and Episodes of The State. The screenplay was co-written by David Wayne and Michael Showalter, who scribed They Came Together, Hello, My Name is Doris, and the television series Search Party. It stars Janine Garofalo as Beth. She was born in Newton, New Jersey, and moved around when she was a kid. She entered a comedy talent search and won The Funniest Person in Rhode Island. Upon graduating from Providence College with a degree in history and American studies, she became a stand-up with the hopes to land a gig on Late Night with David Letterman. She was part of the alternative comedy scene and was known for performing with a notebook on stage. Her breakthrough role would be in 1994 when she was cast as Vicky in Reality Bites. Her first lead would be in The Truth About Cats and Dogs, co-starring Uma Thurman. She would have roles on television in The Ben Stiller Show, The Larry Sanders Show, Saturday Night Live, The West Wing, and episodes of News Radio, Ellen, Seinfeld, and Home Improvement. She's appeared on Comedy Half Hour and Comedy Hour on HBO, and the comedy special, If You Will, on Epix. She was nominated for two Primetime Emmy Awards. David Hyde Pierce portrays Henry. Born and raised in Saratoga Springs, New York, he attended Yale University and majored in English Literature and Theater Studies. He moved to Manhattan and studied at Michael Howard Studios, 
He starred with Kevin Kline in an off-Broadway production of Hamlet, which garnered much attention. He earned a role in the political comedy The Powers That Be, created by David Crane and Marta Kaufman of Friends fame, and produced by Norman Lear. No credits needed there. Even though it was cancelled after the second season, the producers of Frasier saw a resemblance to Kelsey Grammer, and would cast him as the titular character's brother, Niles. On the film front, he's appeared in Sleepless in Seattle, Little Man Tate, and Nixon. He would return to the theater in Spamalot with Tim Curry, and most recently in Hello, Dolly! with Bette Midler. He's been nominated for 11 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning four for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series on Frasier. The rest of the cast includes Paul Rudd as Andy, Marguerite Moreau as Katie, Michael Showalter as Coop, Molly Shannon as Gail, Michael Ian Black as McKinley, Elizabeth Banks as Lindsay, Amy Poehler as Susie, and Christopher Maloney as Jean. This is something to look out for. During the filming of the movie, it rained throughout most of the shoot and was fairly cold. In some scenes, you can see the breath of the actor. The movie starts on August 18th, 1981, the final day at Camp Firewood, which is located outside of Waterville, Maine. It's the last time the counselors can have a fling before it closes for the rest of the summer and they go back home. It all commences with a camp-wide talent show. Beth is the camp director who tries to keep the counselors in line, to little effect. She's interested in associate professor Henry Newman, who teaches astrophysics at a local college, and lives in a cabin right by the camp. Andy and Katie are counselors and currently dating, but he's been unfaithful and she's being courted by Coop, who only recently had his longest conversation with her in the six years that they've been at camp. Gail is the arts and crafts instructor who's recently divorced and, with the support of her campers, tries to get over him. Ben and Susie are responsible for producing and choreographing the talent show, which includes a musical number from Godspell. They make a promise that 10 years from now, they'll meet again and see what kind of people they've blossomed into. Here's a quote without context. You taste like a burger. I don't like you anymore. Wet Hot American Summer is an uneven movie for me. There are moments that I laughed out loud, but for the most part, it was eye-roll inducing. I think they were trying too hard to be funny, mugging for the camera, over-the-top performances, unnecessary pratfalls. I'm not sure if this is where it started, but something that has pervaded comedy is awkwardness. It's like the writers can't think of a clever punchline or one-liner, or they're afraid to go for a joke at the risk of offending someone, and they write in the script, they stare awkwardly at each other. I also don't like when children act smarter or more mature than adults, especially when the adults are really stupid. There was a scene where even the professor asked where he can get a book, the answer being, the library. And maybe that's what this film is supposed to be, but that's not my style of humor. Now, I've been accused of telling dad jokes, but people don't realize that I'm doing it out of spite. Even if this is a parody, it's still ineffective. And I know I shouldn't be holding it against the film, but they had a really talented cast here, even if this was early in some of their careers, and for this to be the product is a little disappointing. They did make a Ruth Buzzy reference, so I gave them points, but they also made a Style Council reference, who didn't form until 1982, so I had to take away the points there. Now for a little trivial trivia. This was the feature film debut of Bradley Cooper, who would go on to star in The Hangover, All About Steve, Silver Linings Playbook, American Hustle, and A Star is Born. He's since been nominated for nine Academy Awards. Wet Hot American Summer was produced by Howard Bernstein. It was filmed at Camp Tawanda in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. The cinematography was captured by Ben Weinstein, whose filmography includes Let It Snow, Roller Hole, and Conspiracy. It was edited by Meg Ricketer, who worked on episodes of True Detective, Flesh and Bone, and American Rust. She was nominated for four Primetime Emmy Awards, three for 30 Rock, and one for the 74th Annual Academy Awards. The score was co-composed by Theodore Shapiro, who wrote the music for Old School, Dodgeball, Tropic Thunder, and Trumbo, and Craig Wedron, who scored School of Rock, Role Models, Search Party, and Glow. The soundtrack featured songs by Jefferson Starship, Loggins and Messina, Rick Springfield, and Kiss. The runtime is 1 hour 32 minutes. It had a budget of $1.8 million and grossed less than $300,000 at the box office. A prequel called Wet Hot American Summer, First Day of Camp, was released in 2015 and includes eight episodes. 
A sequel, Wet Hot American Summer, 10 years later, consisted of eight episodes and available for streaming in 2017. Both features members of the original cast. I give it two and a half out of five stars. Yes, we have fallen from Dog Day Afternoon. Look, it's more Napoleon Dynamite than Neil Simon. Add a star if you enjoy the talents of the cast members. You'll probably like it. If you've seen Wet Hot American Summer and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Moving right along. Each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there will be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. As we head into the 118th United States Congress, when new members get sworn in tomorrow at noon, I wanted to celebrate some of the bonehead initiatives that they spent taxpayer money on. In 1985, a committee was formed called the Parents Music Resource Center, who compiled a list of songs that they deemed were unsuitable. It was co-founded by Tipper Gore, who was appalled to find her daughter singing a Prince song, which had some saucy lyrics. And instead of taking responsibility as a parent, she decided to punish the artists. So the group proposed that the Recording Industry Association of America should label albums with lyrics that could be considered inappropriate with ratings, similar to the MPAA. But the RIAA suggested using a warning label instead. On September 19th, there were hearings where John Denver, Frank Zappa, and Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister testified against the label and about the dangers of censorship. While Dee Snyder was most effective because he appeared in full regalia and outsmarted members of Senate, all three spoke about how leaving it up to people's interpretation of what they consider inappropriate could lead to widespread censorship. I mean, look at the failure that is the MPAA. Billy Elliot, the story of a boy from a mining town who wanted to take ballet, is rated R because of language. But The Expendables 3 is rated PG-13. The Dark Knight is rated PG-13. Jack Reacher, PG-13. The Bourne Movies, PG-13. Taken, PG-13. You seeing a pattern here? Are you telling me that all the movies that I just mentioned are okay for a 13-year-old to watch, with parental guidance, but Billy Elliot, a wholesome story about being accepted by your family, is gonna scar your children because of some language. Please, give me a break. There's a recent trend on TikTok where parents are giving their kids a free pass to use any curse word that they want. Should we arrest all them for child endangerment? Because, you know, cursing bad. Violence? Eh, that's fine. But anyway, on the last episode of the Matt Forgot That podcast, I talked about how one of my department heads thought damn was a faint-worthy, pearl-clutching profanity. Would you want him in charge of determining what content should be categorized as explicit? F Whoopsie! No! Oh, come on! Alphonse! Alphonse! Let that one through. Despite their opposition, it was agreed that a label which stated Parental Advisory Explicit Lyrics would appear on the bottom right-hand side of the album or CD. The first record to receive the sticker was, appropriately, banned in the USA by Two Live Crew. In the end, the joke was on the Parents Music Resource Center. The sales of the albums that featured the sticker skyrocketed. It would have been just as effective to have written, Your parents will hate this. So I selected a couple of clips from the hearings, and they're all available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Clue. With the resurgence in popularity of mystery comedy movies like Knives Out, See How They Run, Amsterdam, and Glass Onion, I wanted to give a tribute to one of my favorites. It's about six strangers who meet up at a New England mansion to confront the person who has been blackmailing them. Tim Curry leads the pack as Butler Wadsworth. He's joined by Eileen Brennan, Madeline Kahn, and Leslie Ann Warren as Mrs. Peacock, Mrs. White, and Miss Scarlet, respectively. The male counterparts of Professor Plum, Mr. Green, and Colonel Mustard are played by Christopher Lloyd, Michael McKean, and Martin Mull. The cast is rounded out by Colleen Camp, Kelly Nakahara, Lee Ving, Bill Henderson, Jeffrey Kramer, Howard Hessman, and Jane Whelan of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame band, The Go-Go's. Jonathan Lynn, known for Nuns on the Run, My Cousin Vinny, Sergeant Bilko, and The Whole Nine Yards, wrote the screenplay and was in the director's chair. 
It was based on the board game Clue or Cluedo, if you're European, which is a combination of Clue and Ludo, which is Latin for I play. It shouldn't work. Has any movie based on a board game really moved the needle? But for some reason, it does. It's legitimately funny, but you do have to like that sense of humor. Play on words, puns, things like that. Everyone in the main cast is charming. They all have their moments to shine. My personal favorite is when Madeline Kahn flips out and talks about the flames on the side of my face, breathing, heaving breath, just hilarious and completely improvised. There were three endings, and when it played in theaters, each screening was random, so you never knew which ending you were going to see. The idea was that people would pay to see each ending. Despite this marketing ploy, it didn't do well at the box office, raking in $15 million off a $14 million budget. On television broadcasts and home video, all three endings are present. A remake is in the works, starring Ryan Reynolds. James Bobin is attached to direct. But that's been in the works for a couple of years now. In the meantime, you have the original clue to enjoy. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me babble. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to MattSaroski.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness. They did make a Ruth Buzzy reference. (laughs) Does anyone know who Ruth Buzzy is? I shouldn't know who Ruth Buzzy is. She entered a comedy talent search and won the funniest person in Rhode Island. (laughs) Isn't that like the hottest person in Arkansas? (laughs) Like who really gives a damn? (laughs) Great, now I've insulted two states.